Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, y'all. Katie, alcoholic. I've had the gift of sobriety since October the 28th of 1984. I cannot believe I am 39 years sober. Uh, I, I think I uh, make uh, sobriety look pretty good, personally. But, uh, you know, it was interesting when Elizabeth called me. I can't remember if she and I were having this conversation, but at some point it came around to, would you like to tell your story? And I'm just not really interested in telling my story right now. Some of you may know it. you Some may not. You know, lost Charlie in May. And uh, uh, my story doesn't have a happy ending yet. It, one of these days it will, but not yet. So replaying it doesn't help me. It might help somebody else, but I'm too self-centered to do that. So she let me have the privilege of telling it. You know, I said, I'll be happy to talk on steps. I'll talk on steps all day long. It's uh, it's in my wheelhouse. It's one of my favorite things in the world to do. So I'm going to do a, a one, two, and three, and we're going to hopefully nail it down and Ooh, 45 minutes. Um, I like to uh, quote a lot out of the book. So if you got your big book by you, please pull it out. And uh, you may want to take some notes quick and then it'll be recorded. So you'll have the opportunity to have that. Dr. Bob uh, made a statement that I think is so profound. I think in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, a lot gets misunderstood. I don't think it's intended to ever be misunderstood. It just gets misunderstood because of the way our uh program is designed. It's it's really, it's got so many loose ends, which I think is personally wonderful. So you can, you can go to a meeting that floats your boat. You can not go to a meeting that doesn't float your boat. I mean, you can do all kinds of things in Alcoholics Anonymous, but Dr. Bob put it the best. Uh, he says the directions are clear cut. That's very, very important. The directions are clear cut, but everybody has a different experience. So sometimes in AA, I think we think we have to find somebody who's had my experience so they can help me. And that's not what the book is designed. The the book's designed as a textbook so that I can help everybody through everything without having had that experience. But my experience is a really important tool uh, because it's what what connects us. It's what keeps us bound together. Uh, It also talks about purpose. There's two, two different purposes in our book. On page 77, it says our real purpose is to fit ourselves to be of maximum service to God and the people about us. Now, the the word fit means to adapt. So my real purpose is to try to adapt. Uh, When I have the root of my problems is selfishness and self-centeredness, that can be rather difficult to adapt. So I don't ever want to fool anybody that I'm walking through this world just kicking my heels up and clicking them and life is great. It Up here, it's quite a challenge sometimes. Some days are better than others. But that's really what I have to remember is I suffer from an illness that's trying to convince me that there's something wrong. And some days it works. Some days it actually does convince me. And then the other purpose is our primary purpose is to carry the message to the other alcoholics who still suffer. So those two purposes are very different in uh, their point. Uh, the first step, oh, Charlie was so much better in the first step. Oh, 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 I left off one purpose. Uh, and then the third purpose is to show other alcoholics precisely how we have recovered is the main purpose of this book. So remember, we're trying to get ourselves to where we're seeing what's in the book. What, what are they trying to teach me in this book? And let me tell you, the big book goes deeper and deeper and deeper the more you get involved. But it is a textbook, so it does need to be taught. It's taught to you. Back in the day, they were handing it out and people were learning from it. That's not my forte because I, I cheated all the way through school. So you hand me a book and I got nothing. I mean, you, you're going to have to show me what, what we're talking about. But the first step was really my husband's cup of tea. But I sat through enough of them and uh, done enough 12-step calls to understand. So I'll do the best I can. Lots of times in my sobriety, I took a lot of the steps off the wall. One time I heard an old timer say, if you take the steps off the wall, you'll get off the wall recovery. And that couldn't have been more accurate because 
you know, once again, I cheated through school. I don't really want to read the book. I don't want to study the book. It wasn't my cup of tea. And and that went on until I was 17 years sober. And I did a whole lot of other things, codependency, group therapy. I mean, we were doing all kinds of stuff in the 80s. You know, what color is your parachute and, you know, Course in Miracles and anything but the steps. And uh, so it says, the first step says, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol and that our lives had become unmanageable. Now, where I misunderstood that, and I misunderstood a lot, I misunderstood that when I drank is when my life was unmanageable. But you take away the booze, and I'm good. Because I, I mean, when you take poison out of your body, sometimes you physically feel better. You sleep better. You get up. But that restless, irritable, and discontent starts to creep in. And sometimes the, the old timers would say, a oh, one's too many and a thousand's not enough. I never understood what the hell they were talking about. And today I get it. I get, I get the whole point. I wish there was a little bit more clarity on what it means to be alcoholic, right? And so what we do when a newcomer comes into a lot of meetings is we share our experience, right? Experience, strength, and hope. And I think what What gets misled here is that we assume that we're letting him know that we get the drinking game, but I think that he's waiting to hear somebody who drank like he drank. And that guy that comes into the room, as we heard from all the newcomers, you know, that's not how this deal works. I need to be armed with the facts about what it means to be alcoholic so I can help you understand because time is of the essence with the new guy. So, so, you know, We're hoping that in a meeting, he hears something. I personally think we should take him out of the meeting. When he raises his hand, he says he's new. He's like, okay, come come here with me. Come here with me. We're going to do a first step experience, right? And to me, I need to explain what it means to be alcoholic, right? I got two problems with alcohol, and this is all my husband. One when I drink it and one when I don't. Other than that, I got no problem with alcohol. And, and to somebody who doesn't understand what it means to be alcoholic, that doesn't even make sense. So I'll break it down the best I can. The first problem with alcohol is when I drink it, right? I trigger, as the doctor's opinion says, the phenomenon of craving. So that phenomenon of craving, if you explain this to the non-alcoholic, they are very intrigued at what we're talking about. Say we're talking about their kid might be alcoholic. So we're going to explain the allergy and the mental obsession. And and. They're fascinated by it. And for whatever reason, we, we kind of forget to, to explain what it means to have the illness that we have. And so that allergy, that was a new word back in 1935. Dr. Silkwood, uh, Silkworth you know, came with that concept to Bill, which really was quite interesting. So this allergy, it shows up in the phenomenon of craving. So when I put one drink in me, the next thing you know, I need a second drink. And even though I know I'm going to get in trouble because I get in trouble every time I drink, this time it's going to be different because I'm going to stop at four. Well, I can't stop at four because I've triggered the phenomenon of craving, right? That allergy is off to the races and four just looks like a bad number. So the next thing you know, I just think I just changed my mind. And then we go on and on and on. But if the allergy was my only problem with alcoholism, the solution would be, well, just don't drink. If you're allergic to peanuts, don't get close to a peanut. But the problem with alcoholism is the second part, right? The allergy is the first part. And the second part is the mental obsession. It will always take me back to the drink, no matter what, until I have this spiritual experience. And trust me, there for you new guys, let me just tell you, there is some white knuckling. You know, you, you're not, most people don't have that immediate uh, spiritual experience. So there's some flipping white knuckling that goes on. And I always like to say to the new guy, if you're having a bad day, put the baby to bed. Just go to bed. Tomorrow's a new day. Let's start getting into the steps. Let's get you some freedom from this. These steps were designed to be worked quickly. If you disagree with that, put put my name in column one and the problem in column two, because I don't have the problem. I've been around long enough to see that the new guy does not have 90 days to just be going to meetings. He's got to get through this work quickly. There's nothing in the book that says, Kick back, take it easy, rest a little bit, right? This physical allergy, too, it's really important to know that the hard drinker does not have that physical allergy, right? The hard drinker, given sufficient reason, can stop or moderate. 
So there's a lot of people that think somebody's alcoholic just based on the fact that they drink a lot. They get in a lot of trouble. That doesn't make them alcoholic. They've got to have the allergy. They've got to have the mental obsession. When you sit down with that new guy, that's where we're going to get some real rubber hitting the road. And this second piece of alcoholism is the restless, irritable, and discontented. Oh, my God. I, I, I swear to God, there's so many better words I could use than those. Those those look bad. They look like the dog who's walking in a circle trying to lay down. I mean, I'm talking crazy up here. Crazy, crazy, crazy. And that happens when I'm stone cold sober. And I get in that vicious cycle where I stop long enough until I got a drink. And then I start drinking until I got to stop or get stopped. And that vicious cycle goes on and on and on. The doctor's opinion is uh, uh, in the first 43 pages of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous do a heck of a job explaining alcoholism. It's the longest, the first step is the longest part of our literature, which really means, you know, some people take people through line by line. I think, I don't think the new guy's got time for that. That's, that's my, my observation. And I would like to say it's my opinion, but it's pretty doggone strong opinion with uh, uh, watching people do it. If you can get somebody through the, the big book in two weeks, line by line, rock on. But if you can't, they don't have that kind of time. We can break it down later. Then it, it talks in the book, too, when I'm convinced that he's the real deal, then we got something to go on. See, I mean, I've, I've now don't get me wrong. I don't want that blood on my hands, but I've watched many a people think that they're alcoholic and they, they just aren't. But if you really want to work the 12 steps, so be it. But I can have seen many people come into Alcoholics Anonymous that are not the real deal and uh, they don't have to do what I have to do, which gives the illusion that, you know, I don't have to work the steps either. All I got to do is go to, you know, meetings. And uh, and once again, that's not knocking meetings. Meetings are a crucial part of our triangle, but the steps are a must or you get like me and you get crazy in sobriety. So remember, the first step's not trying to convince you that you have a problem, but that you have no solution. That That's a, that's a mind blower. If you ask me, why would I be interested in this power in step two if I thought I could still do it on my own power? See, you know, a lot of people say, you know, I got I got a real issue with the God problem. And to me, it's like, you don't have an issue with the God problem. You may not like it. I get that. But you got a first step issue. You still think you can do this on your own power. And that's that that is the one where people are like, you, you get a, caught in your throat. I don't care what your power is, as long as it's more than you. Right. I mean, it could be Mother Earth. It can be anything. Some people lean on the fellowship. I don't know if I'm a big fan of that one, but, you know, try to try to consider something farther out there that might be getting your butt sober. Because the truth of the matter is, is when you look back, your spiritual program like mine will go through a gamut of emotions, constantly going through change all the time. And it says on page 44, and, the, and this is what I love about we agnostics in the second step. It says, in the preceding chapters, you've learned something of alcoholism. Mark Houston, who was a big mentor of mine, used to say, turn statements into questions. Have you read up to page uh, 44, and do you believe that I've learned something about alcoholism? If the answer is no, that's okay. Get somebody to break it down for you. It says, we hope we've made clear the distinction between the alcoholic and the non-alcoholic. That's pretty powerful words right there, that you would know the difference between the two. I thought my dad was alcoholic forever. Come to find out, I'd watch him. He'd be able to quit uh, uh, or, or moderate for long periods of time. And when he started drinking, he didn't just go, you know, down the road with it. He could drink for a few days and quit. So I come to find out my dad's a hard drinker. But I'd have told you up to 17 years sober, he was an alcoholic. And then it says, if when you honestly want to, so that's another good question to ask yourself, you find you can't quit entirely. Or if when drinking, you have little control over the amount you take, eh, you're probably alcoholic. <laughs> and I don't know about you guys. I am so grateful that I have y'all. Without you guys, there's so many people that go through this world and they don't have what we have. So we've been brought out of the depths of hell. I mean, bad. And we've been given each other that we can be excited for you if you got four days, if you got four hours sober. Everyone on this, this meeting is thrilled. 
And they're also thrilled to see me going through my grief, right? I mean, it gives me goosebumps. I get so moved. And I finally got to meet Reggie. I can't wait to give that man a hug. I know his brother so well. I I think my name is Ruby, Ruby White. Yep, I'd be one of you guys. Uh, And so this, this program is about an intimate personal relationship with the creator. And I don't care what you consider your creator, but that's what it's trying to get us to, right? That we can hear this still quiet voice. We agnostics is not about, uh, uh, do you believe in God or do you not, right? Agnostic means one who neither affirms nor denies the existence of a personal deity, right? The, the, the title is a little misleading, but it says half our fellowship was agnostic or atheist, right? Still is. Whenever Charlie and I go on these, uh, you know, workshops or whatever, we ask the group, you know, there could be 500 people out there. How many of you guys were atheist or agnostic? Half the room still raises their hand. That is not new information to us. But as somebody who's taking you through the steps, I need to be prepared to how I'm going to handle that. Right. And then the other thing is, is when we're talking about this we agnostics chapter, we're trying to wake up to the fact that it's talking about our prejudiced. Oh my God, the alcoholic is the most prejudiced individual ever. Call it judgmental, call it whatever you want, but I am so self-centered. I don't think too much of myself or too little of myself. All I think about is me. So everything in the world from a stoplight to somebody mowing their yard is how does that affect me? Okay, I I don't even know I'm doing it, but I am walking through life with that constantly going on in my mind. And I've got to get connected to a power that can help me get through this. And don't get me wrong. I have I have great times. I'm 39 years sober, for God's sakes. I came in at 26 years sober. I mean, 26 years old with a five year old. Those were not great times. But I'd like to also tell you that getting all the way through my sobriety was some, there were some dark, dark times in sobriety because that's natural. It's just going to happen. You're going to hit walls from time to time. It says uh, in the second step, it says we talk of a God consciousness. What is that? Being aware or personal relationship with the creator, right? This is what we're trying to get to is this consciousness, this thought life and conscious life. See, my thought life is constantly going, thinking, 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 thinking. What do I do? Oh, if I don't get that, then I got to get this. Then I can do that. Then I get it. That's my thought life. My consciousness goes up a step and I'm actually calmed down enough to hear the voice of the creator. I, that's what I like to call. I call mine God. If that bothers you. That's all right. One day you'll probably see it my way. Uh, I think it's also important to understand some of the spiritual practices, especially when you're looking at the second step, is um, not just reading spiritual literature, but studying it. So you take a paragraph, you read a line, you turn statements into questions. What does that line mean to you? And then you move on to the next line. Otherwise, we just read it kind of doing a little chicken soup for the soul type of uh, recovery. And that stuff... uh, by lunch, I go, you, you go, oh, my God, did you guys read uh, Emmett Fox this morning's Daily Reader? And it's like, yeah, yeah, I did. And I go, oh, man, wasn't it great? Yeah. What was it? I don't remember. You know, because that's that's what happens. In the moment, I can really feel it, but I just don't see it. I got, um, I want to be 100% sure something. My phone is just beeping like crazy. Be sure everybody is um, with me. Okay. Um. There's lots of warnings in our book, right? Praying for God's will is easy. Acceptance God's will is not so easy, right? Because it's typically not what I necessarily want to do. So there's lots of warnings. It says, if he is an alcoholic of the hopeless variety, to be doomed to an alcoholic death or to live along spiritual basis are not always easy alternatives to face. Think about that. To live on spiritual basis or to be doomed to an alcoholic death? I want to understand what the word doom means. I mean, how bad is it really going to get? That's how much I don't want to work on this spiritual aspect. And then you have to ask yourself, are these your two choices? And there's several places in the book, and I like to to, uh, read these. Page 25, blot out our intolerable situation the best we can or accept spiritual help. 
crushed by a self-imposed crisis we could not postpone or evade. Either God's everything or he's nothing. And then the deliberate manufacture of misery. God didn't do it, but when trouble comes, cheerfully capitalize on it so he can show his omnipotence. You see, it's trying to wake us up that we actually make a choice between those two things. And I don't even know I'm making that choice. I can either take this spiritually or just self-will my way through it, right? It's the lack of power. Really, both of these suck in the moment because I want to get what I want to get and I want to get it now. And if that means that I, you want me to go pray on it, whatever. I know I can go get what I want. And 99.9% .9 of the time I get it and I really don't want it. All we have is identification and power, right? Staying sober is the bare minimum. I didn't realize that. I thought it was the finish line. I really thought alcohol was the problem because when I came into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, I fell in love with the fellowship. I was one of the handful of people that was so fortunate, so fortunate. Uh, I, I like to ask when I'm at conventions, how many of you guys loved AA on day one? And it's, say, a room full of 200 people. It's maybe 10. I had no, I thought it was every one of us in there. That's not the case. And what it did for me, it bought me a little bit of time. And the new guy who can't stand, doesn't even want to be there. He is a ticking time bomb, man. He's the kind of guy you need to keep your arm wrapped around his arm and just go with him everywhere. I know that sounds crazy, but it really is. It's like, it's like leaving your kids unattended and they're only three. That's not a good plan. And, and no disrespect to the new guy, but man, you need, you need somebody tight with you. You got to keep that. You know, I don't care if you got to go to three meetings in one day on a bad day. I, I like to talk about current agnosticism. It says if a mere code of morals or better philosophy of life were sufficient to overcome alcoholism, many as, of us would have recovered long ago. Now think about that. If, if somebody, you know, wants to give me some sort of great saying, well, here's one. Would you rather be right or happy? Oh, like that's going to fix my problem. Did you not just hear what I said? If you want to know the truth, I want to be right. And if happiness comes with it, so be it. But that doesn't fix me. you got to get down to causes and conditions with me. When I'm disturbed, I need you to get me to see this from an entirely different angle. What angle is that? The person I'm typically disturbed with. Get me to see their perspective. Because the truth of the matter is, is I'm a hypocrite. I, I, I am 100% a hypocrite. And the more I see myself as a hypocrite, the freer I am. See, this, this, what happens in sobriety, and, and this is not just me. This is the alcoholics in recovery. You may have gone through this phase. You may be in this phase. You may be out of this phase, going to probably go back into this phase. But the truth of the matter is, is we rest on our laurels because that's the nature of us. It says we alcoholics are undisciplined. We really are. God disciplines us in this very way he just laid out. I mean, are we are we killing 10? Are we really watching throughout the day for resentment, dishonesty, selfishness, and fear? And are we really doing the four things it tells me to do during the day? I thought the 10th step was the evening review. And I wasn't doing it anyway. So let's let's call it what it is. I mean, this I am not here judging anybody. Trust me. I've done everything wrong in Alcoholics Anonymous you could do wrong. And I always like to say, so we, we, if we're not working our AA program, and I don't mean just helping others, I mean actively watching through my day, then in the 11th step evening review, check in my work, how'd I do? Not good is an okay answer. And then take that into on awakening, right? And really seeing what my day is going to look like today if I'm bringing yesterday into it. That's the most important thing. That's what it's talking about living day by day. I've got to keep myself that tight in the moment because by nature, I can't. So what's going to take over? Money, sex, food, exercise. Oh, my God. We have a, anything that can be slightly addictive, we're on it. When we're not working our AA program, we're on it. I always like to say I had a program that I called Chicken Soup for the Soul, right? I could steal in sobriety. Yes, I could. And I could justify it. Uh, I, you can do infidelity. Boy, the book is cautious there. Infidelity. That's the one area it says you, you will drink behind it. I just thought I'd take a sip of that coffee, make you think on that one for a minute. But that is that is a dangerous place to go. You can't you you can't be spiritually fit and unfaithful. They just don't go hand, they, you know, they, hand in glove. No, not at all. Right. The book implies trouble. It gives me many warnings, right? Page 45 says, lack of power, that was our dilemma. 
We had to find a power by which we could live, and that power had to be a greater than ourselves, obviously, but where and how are we to find it? Well, that's exactly what this book's main object is to do, to enable you to find a power greater than yourself, which will solve your problem. Uh, wow. And then my book sat on the shelf for a good 15 years, right? And and I love that it says, it, it talks about prejudice like six times in, in uh, We Agnostics. It's, it's just profound. But here's something that's interesting. The third step says, I'm almost always in collision with somebody or something, even though my motives are good. And the 10th step says, we've ceased fighting anyone or any, anything or anyone. So in those, what? Oh, I used to know the number. It's been a while since I've been out on the road, um, 25 pages. It got us from no freedom to freedom. And we will do anything to avoid that work. Anything. All of us will. Until we, we are in so much pain, we are forced to have to do what the steps are asking us. I misunderstood the third step completely, right? Completely. Uh I thought it was all about, you know, are you alcoholic, explaining what it means to be alcoholic? How do you feel about this God thing? Let's just move you right into the third step. Let's get on your knees and do the third step prayer. Because once again, remember, I was taking the steps off the wall and I uh, decided to turn my will and my life over to the care of God as I understood it, right? But well, there it is. Okay, let's move on. Never, ever did I understand what that third step was about. Today, I call it the second surrender. I think it's easier to get an alcoholic to stop drinking than it is to get one of us to quit playing God. See, remember, alcohol was the solution, not the problem. Alcohol is the only thing that treated the pain of living a life based on self-will. I had no idea. I thought alcohol was the problem. And let me tell you, I am not the only one in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous who thinks that. Take away the booze. I got it from here. Well, yeah, physically, I'm doing well. This thing's starting to go nuts pretty nuts on me. And, and, you know, people call it a pink cloud, call it whatever you want to call it. Thank God there is a pink cloud. Okay. So you fell off. What well, that was, that was a grace period that we hope you work the steps so that when you step off of it, cause you will, you're going to find yourself in deep mud and that mud can be like quicksand, right? It says the root of my problem is selfishness and self-centeredness. Now, let me tell you something. This paragraph breaks it down so clear to me. I am driven, right? A lot of people say, oh, you know, I'm insane. I keep going back to the same boy over and over and over. No, you're not insane. The insanity the book's talking about is only when we pick up a drink. That's the most insane thing we could ever do. But driven is what I am the other 99.9% .9 of the time. I'm driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity. Now think about all those that's where people, you know, tattoo courage and acceptance. I say tattoo this on your arm, man. That's, that's a way better reminder. Oh, let me just say it again. I'm driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity. What do I do? I step on the toes of my fellows and they retaliate, right? All of a sudden, man, I have stepped on your toes and you are pissed. Sometimes they hurt us seeming without provocation, but invariably we find that it's sometime in the past I made a decision based on me that later placed me in a position to be hurt. All of a sudden, your boss jumps your butt at a meeting in front of everybody. And, and if, you're, if you go to your sponsor and you tell them that this guy just treated me poorly and she agrees, she needs to do her job and take it, walk that dog backwards. That guy didn't just jump your butt. You have done something to set this stage. That's just the way it is, guys. I mean, I don't even know I made that decision because it was such a split second decision that I made it. And it isn't until I do a 10th step and walk the dog backwards that I see, oh, my God, I do remember making that decision. Never even considered that I've made the decision. I just thought it was me going through life because I'm asleep a lot. I'm asleep, dreaming I'm awake. See, remember, I don't think too much of myself or too little of myself. All I think about is myself. And that happens while I'm asleep a lot. It says from page 60, it says we were at step three, right? And then that's the many different ways that self shows up, what it's getting ready to tell us. And then on page 63, it says we were now at step three, which is the prayer. I think that's the affirmation of the decision that we just covered so that I can begin to understand what the root of my problem is. Uh, and then it says, which is that we decide to turn our will, that's our thoughts, and our life, that's my actions, over to the care of God as I understand him. Cause and effect. 
cause and effect. It's these external affairs that I'm trying to manage so that I will be okay on the inside. See, life's not coming at me. It's coming from me. See, if I believe that I'm going to lose this job, I actually make it to where I lose the job. That's just the way we're set up. If I walk into a job and I'm a little apprehensive, okay, let's keep that, keep that rolling, right? I'm a little apprehensive. I'm going to ask a couple of questions. I'm not going to over ask questions. I'm going to keep going back in prayer, right? Watching throughout the day, pause when agitated or doubtful. I'm much more doubtful than I am agitated. I'm doubtful. I'm showing up like I don't know what I'm doing on this job. Uh, I, I like to say, Father God, Father God, please guide me and direct me. I'm really smart and I'm a good learner. Show me what my next step is right here. Just a quick redirect, 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 right? Uh, so just what do we mean by that? Just what do we do? I got to rock and roll here. It spends the next two pages explaining what we mean, then it switches over to what we do. So we got to get to the what we mean. Page 61 is the first requirement. So it's asking that I have a requirement, is that we be convinced that any life run on self-will can hardly be a success. We're almost always in collision with somebody or something, even though my motive is good. What? So now I know when I'm being a jerk. Oh, trust me. I mean, that's not new information, right? I'm loud. I'm the sheriff of the world. I'm better than I've ever been now, but I can still be the sheriff of the world. I can, I'm cleavage police, wherever that may be. And, uh, but the truth of the matter is, is this requirement says that I got to be convinced that any life run on self-will can hardly be a success. I'm not. So you want me to give up my pride and my self-reliance? No, not going to do it. No, I can get way more in life. So see, at that point, I was not convinced at all. I wasn't convinced at 17 years sober, sitting in the presence of Mark Houston, you know. Uh, Charlie fell in love with it. I, on the other hand, was like, yeah, whatever. Uh, and come to find out, you know, wow, what a man. His depth was incredible. But my pride was so big that they had no idea all the work I've done on myself. You're not going to teach me anything. And then it tells me behind good motives. Wow. So I'm just a giver, just trying to be helpful, you know. I'm going to set up all the chairs at the, the meeting every day and by about a month and a half into it. Nobody else is doing it. And I'm a little pissed off. You know, am I the only one that's doing this? See, it turns from a good motive and it just gets me pissed off. See, uh, uh, I don't know. I have a kind motive until you don't react the way I want you to. Right. Let you in in traffic. You need to give me one of these for a while. Thank you very much. You're very welcome because I'm such a giver. Right. Hold the door for somebody. Oh, for God's sakes, for whatever reason, in this day and age, you can't even make eye contact with people. You younger generation, you need to straighten that up. You need to make some eye contact and smile at people. Nobody's saying it. I'm saying it. I, I am shocked what's going on. But you're not going to get a door held for you either. That's just the way it is. I, I, I'm baffled by that. But need I not get off on a tangent? Okay. So these good intentions, see, I didn't mean to hurt you. And the next thing I know is you're upset with me. I don't even realize it. I'm the actor running the whole show. I'm forever trying to arrange the lights, the ballet, the scenery, and the rest of the players in my own way. Now, that's an interesting one, right? So I am the actor. I'm not the director. So I'm going to tell everybody exactly how they need to do it, what they need to do. I mean, just, just be a member of a home group and go to a group conscience. Oh, that's a fun one. If you've not seen a chair fly through the air at a group conscience, you haven't been to all the group conscience out there. Let me tell you. Well, this delusion is that if only my arrangements would stay put, if only people would do like Katie wants, this show would be great, right? I'm more the ego turned out. If you're the ego turned in, you're the one that's sitting quietly with all this just going on in your head. I just happen to be the one who's saying it, right? But now for me to be quiet, as it's difficult for you to speak up. So don't get lost on self-centeredness. You know, you don't want to be looking at me going, wow, she really is self-centered. No, no, no. That is the root of our problem. This, you, you don't get to miss this one. Trust me. So I just want Katie Topia, right? You take my motives and my delusions, filter it through my actions through there, and we should have utopia. And then when I screw up, I'm going to explain it to you. And it goes into telling me the toolkit of self-will. So in trying to make these arrangements so that everybody's happy with Katie today is I have to be kind, considerate, patient, generous. 
it doesn't go my way, I'm mean, egotistical, selfish, and dishonest. And I mean, it can be that fast. I got hundreds of stories, but today I'm just trying to fly through all of this. So what usually happens? Well, the show doesn't come off very well. He begins to think life doesn't treat him right, right? There comes the self-pity. He decides to exert himself more. There's the driven by fear. He becomes on the next occasion still more, more demanding or gracious. There's that toolkit of self-will. As the case may be, still the play doesn't suit him, admitting he may be somewhat at fault. He's sure others are more to blame. That's where the term my part needs to go out the window, right? This is all my part. This is all me. We're not dividing pieces. I always, it may seem like a simple little word. It is very uh, deceiving if you're not careful. So what happens? He becomes angry, column two, indignant, column three, and self-pity, column four. See, the book is constantly moving me towards inventory, inventory, inventory. So what's his basic trouble? Is he really not a self-seeker even when trying to be kind? Sometimes people say they're they're, they're uh, people pleasers, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, let's just line up all the people you've pleased here, right? What we are is approval suckers. We're not, we're not, we, we, we cloak everything because the illness is delusional. And if it can convince you you're this, then you don't, you stop looking at, at your depth of self-centeredness, right? Not stingy and conceited, self-consumed. And then it says, is he not a victim, which means tricked or duped of the delusion that he can wrest satisfaction and happiness out of this world if he only manages well, right? This delusion that he can rest means seized by force, satisfaction being right, and happiness out of this world. Now, I like the best word in there that I like is delusion. It's an impression that is firmly maintained despite being contradicted by what is accepted as reality. <laughs> typically a symptom of a mental disorder. Other than that, rock on, right? And and I told you, I, I, would you rather be right or happy? I, I can, I, I'll kill both of us. That's just the way that deal's going to play out. It's, it's, it's not going to work out well, right? Is it is it not evident to all the rest of the players that these are the things he wants? And don't his actions make each of them wish to snatch and retaliate everything they can out of the show? Is he not even in his best moments a producer of confusion rather than harmony? Now, if you've never heard this in the third step, nor had I, 17 years sober, I thought the third step was all about turning my will and my life over the care of God as I understood him. Oh, oh my God, missed all of this. So can you imagine the wreckage I had in 17 years with this personality? Oh, it's like the Ray Donovan of the world, right? Anybody in my company didn't like somebody, they just call Katie in the office because you can't really tell HR. And you go, Katie, can you can you go take that person out? I'm like, I'm on it, sir. Yeah, absolutely. Will do. No consideration for that other individual. I just take you out. That's what we did. And I did it for years. When I woke up after I came back from uh, when I was in untreated alcoholism, I wasn't treating my alcoholism. I was doing five meetings a week. Never wrote a piece of inventory. I sponsored people all with therapy, and uh, it took me four years to come out of untreated alcoholism. Why? The level of pride I carry around, oh, it's not going to just fall off like that. And the truth of the matter is, is it's one of those, it's one of those things when I look back, I am so blown away that God brought me through this, and I was able to go back to those hundreds of people that I stepped on their life with no consideration whatsoever of what they were going through. And I was able to make those amends. I made more amends in untreated alcoholism than I ever did in active drinking. Uh, and I'm telling you, it's the rooms are riddled with it. And uh, I'm, I'm here to help you through it because I've been there, done that, know what it looks like, know the, know the way to go. Uh, and then it says, uh, it, it, one of the things is I can see it in others, right? I'm I'm blinded to my self-centeredness in me. Now, the longer I'm sober, I'm better off than I've ever been. But I am blinded to it some of the times. I mean, that's why I'm calling Marty going, God dang, Marty, I got to do it. I got to do a, a 10 step with you. This person is pissing me off just looking at me. I'm mad at him. It says, so our troubles are of our own making. That's one of the greatest promises in the book, right? If I want to be free, the problem's got to be me. They arise out of ourself, and the alcoholic is an extreme example of self-will run riot, comma, though he usually doesn't think so. There's the delusion. 
there's where you step in the mud and you never even saw it. And now it's all over your foot. I mean, to tell you guys, do not be fooled at how this illness will pull you down. All of us know people who have had time that relapsed three years, 10 years, 20 years. It, it will eventually pull you down. It says, uh, many of us had moral and philosophical convictions galore. We couldn't live up to them no matter how hard we tried, right? Trying to work on these character defects is not it. Self-knowledge or awareness are important to see what's driving me, but it's the values, the old ideas in that third column of a resentment inventory that's going to really, really wake me up, right? I got to see what's driving me. See, I'm a good AA, (laughs) really a better AA than you. I'm a good mom. Uh, I'm a better mom than you. You see, my old ideas don't mean bad. It's just the way the ego is going to turn them on me. Okay, so I got only five more minutes left, so I'm going to bust through this. So this decision was a vital and crucial step. Vital means key to life. Now, that's pretty damned important. I, 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 my vital signs are pretty important, right? Especially the older I get. It could have little or permanent effect unless at once followed by a strenuous effort to face and be rid of the things in ourselves which had been blocking us. Our liquor was but a symptom. So we had to get down to causes and conditions. This is, this is where the book is saying, get the person through the steps quickly. There, there is no slacking on this deal, you know, and don't ever give a sponsee, tell them to write an inventory and not give them a date they need to have it completed by because that, that, that could take forever. So when we go back to the, uh, the part of, I believe it's on page 60, 60 something. 62, it's, uh, that's the end of what do we mean? Now, what do we do? I love the steps. They tell you how, when, and why to take them. It, you know, first of all, we have to quit playing God. Why? It didn't work. I mean, I got to know everything, right? I got to get this all the way through. We had to have God's help. Next, we decided, now here's that decision. The prayer is the reiteration of the decision. God was going to be our director, right? Remember, I am an actor. I am not the director. He's the principal. We're his agents. That means to be empowered to act on his behalf. Bob Bazant doesn't ever like me to say that line. He goes, I I don't like that. I don't like that. I go, well, the truth of the matter is, is I can help when no one else can. That's the other gift we've been given in sobriety. I can help a drunk when nobody else can. He's the father. We're his children. Most good ideas are simple. And this concept was the keystone of the new and triumphant arch, which we should pass to freedom. Bill was all big about masonry stuff. And a keystone is that top one that makes the arch, right? Uh, and then it, we, we go into, you know, just being sure that we have the identification, the power. I just, I want to be sure I leave a little bit of time for questions and answers or just comments of what you got. And uh, uh, one of my favorite things to uh, look at is, and this is beautiful. I'm, I always like to say in your 20s, you're bulletproof. In your 30s, you're trying to find out who you are. You, are you going to have kids? Are you going to get married? What job are you going to do? You start kind of narrowing it down. In your 40s, you look back at that decade to see how it's going. You got a little bit of cockiness. And trust me, if I could take any decade, I'd go back to my 40s. I love the skin and the hair in my 40s. And uh, oh, and the muscle. And then your 50s, you know, you're clearly on the back nine. Charlie used to say, you're just hoping you're not, you know, putting on the 18th hole. And uh, and then in your 60s, oh, my God, at half the stuff in life, you're like, whatever, whatever. I just, you know, I'm going to be 66 this month. And I'm in this spot where it's like, whatever, yeah, take it or leave it. But it took me 66 years to get here. So let's not, let's not lose sight of that. So spiritual growth comes like maturity. So at three years sober, uh, at 10 years sober, what, what worked at three years sober will no longer work. You have to keep maturing spiritually. And, and that's not a different practice. That's taking 10 and 11 deeper. I don't care what spiritual teacher you're using. You have to go deeper into your old ideas and these causes and conditions. I love what Bill said. It says, My friend promised when these things were done, I would enter upon a new relationship with my creator, that I would have the elements of a way of living, which would answer. Two minutes, Katie. Thank you. I got it. Yeah, I got it. Thank you. I've got a time or two. Uh, I would have the elements of a way of living, which would answer all my problems. Belief in a power greater than myself, plus enough willingness, honesty, and humility to establish and maintain the new order of things were the essential requirements. 
that answer all my problems, guys. We don't need nine 12 step programs. We just need our AA program. We've been gifted alcoholism. Simple but not easy. A price had to be paid. It meant the destruction of self centeredness. I must turn in all things to the Father of Light who presides over me. See, I'm there. The new guy's the blood. The guy with times the oxygen. The blood cannot live without the oxygen. If you've been around for a while and you're not feeling it, there is a whole nother level. So if you're not in the book, please get in the book. It's been an honor and a privilege. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.